Hello, Internet. I'm Evan Dushevsky, Features Editor with PCMag.com. Welcome to The Convo. My guest today is the software pioneer behind the landmark PC game series Ultima. The various chapters of that series laid the groundwork for what video games of all genres and platforms could strive to be. Uh, but there's much more to the story than that. Today's guest is the real-life, world's life interesting man. Uh, he's had some truly amazing IRL adventures, including visiting the Antarctic, He's explored the Amazon. He's traveled down to the bottom of the ocean to visit the remains of the Titanic. And, uh, oh yeah, he's been, he spent two weeks in space. Um, now, so his life, career, adventures are all documented in his new memoir, which is out right now, Explore, Create. Um, Richard Garrett, a.k.a. Lord British to many of you, uh, welcome to the convo. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to be here with you. Definitely. Okay, now for those of you who are watching at home, the show is called The Convo, Not The Dialogue. So if you're watching live on Facebook and you have any questions for Richard, drop them in the comments and social Pete will read them throughout the show. Okay, so Richard, you've done so much amazing stuff. So, But let's take it back to the beginning. Now we talked a little bit about it, is that back in 1979, you created one of the very first role-playing video games, I think we, it's fair to say that, yep. a Calabeth, yep. World of Doom. Okay, it was written on BASIC and designed for the Apple II. Now, I love stories how people do things Things just for their own uh, passion or for their own amusement, and then they turn out to be big successes. So you just did that kind of for your friends or kind of for yourself, well, right? Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, back in the 70s, that's when the game Dungeons and Dragons was published mm -hmm. uh, in high school. Of course, uh, I was an avid reader of Lord of the Rings. I think it was assigned, probably still is, to kids back. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the biggest back then, yeah. and uh, uh, so I was an avid, you know, role player already. Mm -hmm. And that's when also the beginning of the personal computer era uh, arrived. And so I was originally fascinated by teletypes, even okay. before the Apple II. Wrote, in fact, a series of role-playing games on a teletype, but there's no market uh, or other users uh, or way to distribute for a teletype. Mm -hmm. But when I got a hold of the Apple II, first thing I did is I just said, hey, I'm, I'm having fun making these little role-playing games, frankly, for myself. Mm -hmm. Even my friends could rarely play them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I created this game, uh, Acalabeth. Mm -hmm. And I had a summer job at a Computerland store. And mm -hmm. Computerland was trying to sell these $3,000 pieces of hardware. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know the, the software people would buy to play them uh, would be things like a checkbook balancing program or a recipe card file mm -hmm. handler and a really crummy word processor on tractor feed uh, mm -hmm. printers. And uh, it was the owner of the Computerland store that said, Richard, you know, this game is way better than any of these other junk we're trying to, you know, hawk to people to sell these mm -hmm. expensive machines. Why don't you why don't you market it? Why mm -hmm. don't you sell it? And I, I spent my life savings of two hundred dollars <laughs> on uh, Ziploc bags and Xerox cover sheets, which was state of the art packaging in the mm -hmm. day. Started selling them on the store wall on the pegboard like every other piece of software. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I got a call within about a week of that uh, from uh, one of the early distributors yeah. saying we'd like to publish your game nationwide they put it in a bigger Ziploc bag, raised the price from $20 to $35, and uh, uh, started mailing me money. And mm -hmm. so they, they sold about 30,000 copies. Mm -hmm. And if you do that math, that's $150,000 for seven weeks of after school time in high school, <laughs> when my dad's salary as an astronaut mm -hmm. was $65,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And so uh, everybody in my family was like, that was a pretty good idea. <laughs> Maybe you should go do another. <laughs> so now, so you're around 1819 in 1980 and in the first year or so you've made over a hundred thousand dollars what does a 19 year old in 1980 and that's 1980 money do with a hundred thousand dollars well that was right as I was going off to college yeah. so you know you uh, uh, you know you're the king of college you are the king of college well, yeah. what's interesting is my you know my first I bought my first mm -hmm. car which was a hand-me-down from my brother a Subaru hatchback so mm -hmm. not exactly a splurge uh, you know, when I, I, I did, therefore, also start paying for my own college versus uh, mm -hmm. needing to borrow from the folks. Uh, and, uh, uh, and pretty quickly, I, I realized that I could, you know, augment any party with whatever libations and uh, sure, sure. toys might be required. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, uh, uh, but that was sort of a two-edged sword. I mean, I, I, would, I would say the, the, the bad part about a, a success that early is you really never go through a time of tight budgeting. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, you know, that, that came later. 
<laughs> um, for anybody who's just joining us, uh, my guest today is Richard Garrett, a.k.a. Lord British. Okay, so now you also go out to California at one point. I think you have a job, or at least you're meeting with some other the distributors and companies. Now, you, go, you mentioned in the book something I've heard about the early computer industry, particularly the California industry. There's a lot of drugs out there. Yeah. Um, a lot of the companies, they weren't directly dealing coke and pot. They were at least associated with people who were. Uh, that was just a part of the, the culture it, back it then. It was totally part of the culture. Yeah, I mean, yeah. In fact, it's shocking. <clears throat> it's shocking to reflect on. It's been shocking to reflect on since it happened. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, in fact, I'm a little disappointed here today because it used to be when I'd go out to a magazine publisher that uh, we would often be in a glass, uh, uh, you know, conference room like mm -hmm. this. And there would be people scratching lines of cocaine out on the table in full view of all their staff and any other businesses in the in the building. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was that nonchalant. We have a beer fridge. That's close. Yeah, 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 That's yeah, close. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, close. Yeah. Yeah. Pick, pick your poison. Sure, sure. So, yeah, yeah. 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 Simple, we'll have to go visit here in a minute. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, but actually, that's uh, honestly why a number of those early companies went out of business. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, my the the first company I worked with, the one that had put it in the bigger Ziploc bag, uh, they just stopped paying me and oh. all the other authors. So we all, of course, left. Yeah. Uh, same thing, second company I worked for, they just quit paying me and most of the other offers, so we just walked off and left. Yeah. Uh, and that's actually what drove my brother and I to form Origin. It mm -hmm. wasn't because we specifically wanted to be our own bosses, it's because people quit paying us despite our top selling games. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in the book, uh, in Explore Create, uh, you, are, you refer to yourself um, as a nerd a few times. Now, in the past few decades, the term nerd and other similar terms have kind of undergone this transformation. We even have a sister company, geek.com, so it's you know, something we're aware of. Okay, now I hope you take this as a compliment, that the compliment that it's meant to be is that people like you, Bill Gates, Steve Wozniak, are true nerd heroes. Um, I just wonder, how do you feel about nerd culture, self-described nerd culture, kind of finding its way in, into the mainstream and perhaps right. led by people like you? You yeah, no, no. I, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> well, first of all, I agree with that completely. Yeah. And, uh, and for me, there was a very interesting point in time where I knew that culture had caught up to us. Yeah. You know, prior to this moment, we describe, uh, but especially all the way back in high school, you know, nerds were the outcasts and uh, the cool people did not hang out with the nerds. Mm -hmm. uh, but pretty quickly, you know, once you start in this business, you know, we knew that nerds were beginning to rule the world, yeah. and the, the, the writing was on the wall, but it still wasn't cool specifically. Yeah. Um, it was tolerated. <laughs> uh, but uh, the day I knew it changed is an interesting Disney moment. Okay. So if you remember the animated movie 101 Dalmatians, sure. the main male lead, his job is he's a starving writer. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the live action version that I think came in the late 80s, maybe the early 90s, I don't remember the exact date, <clears throat> um, the main lead male character, his job is he's a starving computer game designer. Oh. And that literally was the day that I realized my job has just gone from, you know, kind of weird, you know, counterculture to absolutely mainstream coolness. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I knew I'd made it. <laughs> uh, Facebook, I see you have a question. What's your take on uh, augmented reality and uh, virtual reality in gaming? Um, how long do you think until we'll see that be completely mainstream? And which do you think is going to be more important? Yeah, well, that's a very, very tough question. But, uh, you know, broadly, I consider myself both a huge VR fan. You know, I go back to, you know, every, every piece of VR hardware that has existed, I think I've uh, likely owned or used it to some degree, going back to really crummy ones on the Apple II. They actually had VR goggles for the Apple II. Uh, you know, it had tiny little viewports and terrible lag, so I mean, it, it, uh, it wasn't particularly use useful, but at least it was the foundation. And of course, the hardware has gotten far, far better now, and I would say is uh, approaching uh, the quality we need from a hardware standpoint, especially if you're willing to put, you know, thousands of dollars into the Vive or some of these other, you know, particularly high-end systems. Mm -hmm. What I have yet to see is products that on an individual basis, when somebody experiences, universally, when somebody experiences VR, they go, wow, that was really cool. I'm so, and you want to bring your friends in and show them all this thing called virtual reality. What I have not seen is people going to these experiences saying, that was so cool, I have to come back tomorrow, both into that same world and whatever worlds that I can uh, consume or, or find, because it's such a compelling experience, I'm willing to invest tons of money there. And while there's tons of investment going into hardware, billions, and that some of those billions are, you know, probably millions, if not hundreds of millions, are being therefore poured over to software developers. And so your software developer is making a profit off developing virtual reality uh, applications. I see few 
kind of uh, independently developed products that are funded not by the hardware, but they're funded by you know, investors who are selling to consumers individually, not bundled with the hardware, who are making enough money to support themselves. And so I don't think we found the killer app yet. Uh, and, and I think the reason is not because people aren't trying. I think it's because it's still fairly elusive to know, you know what is it about VR that uh, uh, makes it uh, someplace I really want like, to live, you know, live full time like you do you know, logging on for eight hours into uh, a normal virtual world. Um, so moving on from uh, Calabeth, you went and you uh, created the Ultima series. It's a big, huge hit, uh, had a big, huge cult following as Cambot. I don't know if you can <laughs> scroll over and see if some of the cult following that has, has wanted to watch this live. <laughs> um, okay, so Ultima's a big thing. And then eventually you come uh, in the early 90s, you design Ultima Online. This is in like an America Online sort of dial-up days. Okay, now this was not the first online, online game, but it is generally credited as the first MMO RPG. Now, online gaming communities like those are they're strange sociological experiments, which kind of provide some insight because they show how people would behave in an alternative uh, world with different rules and circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, as someone who has watched online game culture evolve from the very beginning, uh, what have you learned about humanity through that? Well, you know, here, here's one of my takeaways. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I think that's all uh, uh, quite accurate. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's interesting that, you, you know, since I go back to the beginning of gaming, much less on online gaming. Mm -hmm. You know, gaming in its early days and probably still today, you know, gets has plenty of critics. Sure. Uh, and early on, you had completely ludicrous critics like uh, you know religious extremists who thought we were converting their children to literally devil worship. You, you did know, have like, a pentagram on the cover of your first game. Well, that was in response. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. That, okay, was, yeah, that yeah. was my reaction to the sure, criticism. Okay, okay, that was okay. my snub yeah. to uh, <laughs> the, the criticism. Yeah. But uh, uh, which backfired a bit, by the way, yeah. too, because a lot of stores wouldn't carry it because yeah. of it. But uh, uh, the uh, uh, but also people saying, you know, hey, your kids, if you're sitting playing on a computer all day long, you know, you're not outside in the sunshine mm -hmm. and exercising your muscles, much less having a social interaction with other people. Mm -hmm. And and to some degree, that's true. We all need to manage the time we ourselves and our yeah. kids, you know, spend uh, uh, in front of our electronic devices. That being said, what I have found that I think is quite interesting is that you know if you look at how human culture has evolved, mm -hmm. you know prior to maybe a hundred years ago, you lived pretty close to where you worked, mm -hmm. and that also means your neighbors probably worked either at the same place or someplace similar. If you mm -hmm. lived in a farming community, you know they, you might work in the same farm or you work in a neighboring farm, but you're sort of all in the farming business mm -hmm. or factory business or whatever it might be, and so you knew your neighbor well. You wouldn't. You knew them by name. You would have no problem going over and borrowing a cup of sugar because you know you probably even know what they had for dinner last night. Mm -hmm. Your kids are in the same schools. Your, your your feasts and famines as a community are shared. But in modern commuting lifestyle, that's no longer true. Now we are physically separated from those people we have common interest in, whether that's work interest or private social interest. You know, most of us, if we know our next door neighbor's name at all, mm -hmm. which often we don't. Uh, you very likely don't work the same place, children don't go to the same school, all the other th reasons that you wouldn't be comfortable going over buying a cup of sugar. Mm -hmm. And to me, online games help fix that. Mm -hmm. They give you a teleporter to bridge the space of the physical world distance between us. Mm -hmm. It lets you find people of absolute like interests. You do have honest to goodness shared experiences which are truly meaningful. Mm -hmm. Playing a game is, is at least as meaningful as sharing the experience of going to watch a movie, which most people don't do that alone. They mm -hmm. prefer to go with friends. Uh, and games are deeper, harder, more meaningful, and you similarly are compelled to do them with friends. Mm -hmm. And what we found is that the friendships people make online then become things that people are motivated to reinforce in the real world. Mm -hmm. And so we now, with our communities, celebrate and, and, and encourage and reward people who've who've made a friendship online but then go out of their way to find each other in reality and shake hands and you know you know put the face to the name and mm -hmm. and uh, and continue that the uh, deepening that that uh, relationship so i think i think online games provide an important modern service sure uh facebook i see you have a question what's your advice for the latest generation of game developers well you know it's uh, a <clears throat> it's interesting uh uh my my advice hasn't changed much down through the years uh, other than nowadays, it's become a lot easier with uh, such great development tools and engines to be able to do prototyping, if not final work in, like you know, we haven't used Unity. I'm a big fan of Unity. Uh, but, but fundamentally, uh, you know, it sort of relates to the book, I, you know, this explore and create. I actually, I actually believe that if you want to create something original and different and compelling, you cannot do that unless you are an avid student 
of the reality in which we live. If you don't go out and explore, uh, which you could also rephrase as research the problem deeply, usually in fields un, in, un, out of unrelated fields. I mean, if you wanted to make a game, a role-playing game, you know, you can't do it just by playing the other role-playing games that are out there and saying, hey, I like that one. Uh, you know, I like Worlds of Warcraft. I'll make another one just like it, but I'm going to add more med packs or better pricing strategies. Because, you know, those guys are probably already thinking of those ad additions, mm -hmm. and they're way ahead of you on the curve, and they've got a team together, and they have a market, and they have a following. Uh, if you're going to beat somebody, the way you're going to do it is by uh, researching content or ideas from far divergent fields or other aspects of reality that you bring back to gaming and find a way to make compelling. Uh, you know, I, I find a lot of my ideas in B movies, you know, late night B movies, uh, or uh, uh, you know, Pulp Fiction, mm -hmm. or uh, exploring different parts of the world, or cultures, or languages, or you know, science. It can be a wide variety of places, but uh, usually it's not from other games. Mm -hmm. Now we'll go into some of your very cool explorations in a bit, but also, um, so we put out questions, or uh, we ask people to give us questions uh, even on social media before the show, but keep asking your questions now. Uh, one question we got was from at Startup Tim on Twitter. He asked if you would ever consider buying the Ultima brand uh, back from EA, who currently owns the brand. Um, well, they're not doing much with it. I don't think no, they're, they're not, well. I mean, they, yeah. they periodically, um, most commonly believe they are going to do something yeah, with yeah. it, which is one of the reasons they uh, that we've not gotten back together on something. Yeah. So uh, every few years, I actually reapproach EA about uh, joining forces to do something with the Ultima brand. Mm -hmm. And usually, their their senior staff says, "That's a really great idea. Why haven't Why haven't we been pursuing that?" Yeah. And then they go ask around their middle management, and some part of EA goes, "Oh yeah, well you can't let Richard go take it back because we had these big bold plans, and yeah. obviously he would cut us off if if he did." Yeah. And so inevitably it goes nowhere. So that that mm -hmm. the, that discussion has re-emerged re over and over again. Mm -hmm. uh, but sell it outright, I actually don't think they would do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, the underworld, Paul Nerath just got the, the word underworld out, but specifically without the word Ultima attached to it okay. the, for the Ultima Underworld series. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think it would be difficult. I would love to do it. If EA is listening, let's talk again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but but uh, I, I think it's uh, unlikely. Gotcha. Okay, so let's talk about some of the <clears> adventures. <throat> uh, one of them, and kind of the biggest one, is says in 2008 you paid 30 million dollars to go to space for 12 days. You worked with the, the Russian space agency. Now mm -hmm. I've got to tell you that everything I've heard about going to space sounds horrible. So we <laughs> we had astronaut Mike Massimino in a few months back, oh, yeah. and he describes that like when you go in prolonged zero gravity, your face swells up and snot's just coming out of every orifice. True. And even in your book, you describe space, you're talking about how they have to keep fans going or you'll die in your sleep. True. Um, <laughs> or you have, um, you know, they have a whole section about how difficult it is to use the bathroom in space. Um, That's true. Space, space sounds awful, <laughs> but as you seem like you're still a fan, so defend space to me. Uh, yes, well, very, so first okay. of all, those negatives are are absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, and I could probably add a few more in if I thought about it. Yeah. Uh, bone loss, muscle loss, mm -hmm. uh, uh, anyway, a bunch yeah. of others. But radiation, everything, yeah. sorry, else. the yeah. list goes on and on. Yeah, yeah. But the, there, there's, there's two giant pluses that overwrite all that. Okay. Uh, the smaller of the two is spending 24 hours a day floating around like Superman, flying around and floating around like Superman. Mm -hmm. That is a feeling that never gets old. Uh, you know, in fact, I've, I, before I ever flew in space, I did a whole bunch of zero-g parabolas, both yeah. here in the States and in Russia. And if you ever get a chance to do that, much cheaper than going in space. Yeah. I highly recommend it. I still do it all the time. Uh, it's actually identical to being in space from a physics standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is just a giddy, joyous feeling you have 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Mm -hmm. But the really big one, far, far bigger than that, maybe an order magnitude up from that, is something called the overview effect, mm. which is really just comes from looking out the window. And to try to describe this very briefly, you know, you're, you're traveling 17,000 miles an hour going around the Earth. That means you go all the way around in 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. That means you sunrise or sunset every 45 minutes. That means you cross whole continents like the U.S. in 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You, you're only 250 miles up, so you know, if this was the name of the Earth, you know, you're the width of a nickel or so you know, above the surface. You're very close, yet you can see the whole Earth. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so as you look out the window, it feels like there's just this fire hose of reality pouring into your mind about uh, tectonic plate movement and mm -hmm. how weather forms and moves and erosion by wind and water and uh, all of the impact of humanity with clear-cutting of forests and burning down the rainforest and... Uh, roads in all the deserts and roads mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the Amazon and all the jungled areas mm -hmm. and 
uh, you and, and then for me, after about 100 orbits, mm -hmm. I saw uh, the U.S. and I saw where I grew up back in Texas. Mm -hmm. And when I saw Texas, where I you know, grew up most of my life, and I said, I know the scale of it by hiking it, biking it, riding it, driving it. Mm -hmm. And I've now been around the whole Earth 100 times. I now know the true scale of the Earth mm -hmm. by direct observation. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, I had a physical reaction where the Earth went from being this amorphously large, huge place to try to travel around even on speedy planes mm -hmm. to being really this finite and small place. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's truly a life-changing moment. Cool. Uh, now, you've, so you've had some other <coughs> adventures. You've been to the Antarctic, you've been to the Amazon, uh, mm -hmm. you've and you've been to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so just like, you know, where else are you planning to explore? You're probably going to want to, you know, jump in a volcano at some point. Oh, of course. And, and come back out. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Of course. Yeah, so no, but like, what, do you have anything on, in the works? And by the way, sticking a stick in the volcano crater yeah. in, the vol in the lava is one of my bucket list items. So that, okay, is, okay. that is one. Sure, sure. And, uh, but, uh, but I haven't yet been to the North Pole, so I've got to go do that. I actually uh -huh. was set up to do a sub trip down there until the Russian government took it over and kicked me off. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then... Uh, uh, my favorite thing to do contemporaneously mm. is uh, I go to visit disappearing indigenous tribes. Mm. So uh, a year ago over the holidays, uh, my wife and I packed our six-month-old and our two-year-old, and we went into the jungles uh, between uh, Cambodia, Thailand, and uh, Laos, uh, and hiked around with the uh, native populations. Some families go to Disney fun? World, and you know, some families. Disney World was this year. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, Facebook, you have a question. So you had to pay a lot of money in order to go into space, I assume. Um, when do you think it's going to be something that's mainstream that, like, the average person could, you know, book a flight on? Yeah. So there's good news and bad news on that front. You know, the good news is the price is dropping by multiple orders of magnitude very quickly. And so peak price and peak danger, by the way, would have been on the space shuttle. Uh, I would argue that it costs about $100 million to put an astronaut up on the space shuttle, and it absolutely was predicted to and did kill one out of 70 people that boarded it. Hmm. So that's a pretty heavy cost in multiple ways. Uh, the vehicle I went up on, Soyuz, uh, today it's actually about $50 million a seat. But uh, with SpaceX, they've not announced any pricing. But my guess is, because they have more people in the capsule, uh, that it should come out to about $20 million a piece. As you know, SpaceX is now making reusable launch vehicles, right? You've probably seen their first stage come back and land. They even plan to land the capsule. Uh, Elon thinks that if he can get even more of it to uh, be reusable by landing it, uh, he can get the price down to somewhere close to $1 million. So that's one hundredth of the price. So that's obviously a profoundly cheaper, but it's still a million bucks. And you know, most people aren't walking around with a million bucks in their corner in their pocket. They're just trying to burn somewhere fun. And so uh, that's still not going to be um, uh, cheap enough for everyday use. Uh, and even if you go theoretical, there's some exotic forms of transportation. Like my wife was working on something called electromagnetic propulsion, where they beam energy to the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And that might get it down to um, $100,000 a person, uh, in theory. Uh, but that's which is also still expensive. So it's there's it's never going to really be a vacation spot like in 2001. But the good news is that once you go from a hundred million dollars down to say below five million dollars, well, I did a lot of work on my flight to try to offset the terrible ticket price that I paid, and I earned back some millions of dollars against my many millions of dollars of cost. Mm -hmm. But if the price was only a couple million bucks, I would have made a profit. Mm. And if I can make a profit by being willing to work while I'm on orbit, I'm going a lot. <laughs> and I expect most of you would go too. If you could be paid to be there, you're probably willing to do a little work. And so, you know, those those seats will still be fought after. I mean, it's not going to be, you know, there's going to be still a limited supply. But now it becomes an entrepreneurial issue. And so it's not going to be vacation. It's going to be for entrepreneurs. Mm. And that's coming very soon. You know, five years, maybe 10 at the most. Uh, Facebook, you have a question. Do you think you'd ever make another MMO, even if it's not necessarily an Ultima game? Well, yes. In fact, fancy you should ask, because I am right now. I'm, I'm working on a game called Shroud of the Avatar. Go to www.shroudoftheavatar.com and come join us, because we're a completely crowdfunded, uh, community-supported uh, game. Uh, it's, uh, we're, uh, we don't officially have an alpha, beta kind of state, but we're now only months from the final launch, so mm. you could call that a beta state if you were, if you were a betting person. Uh, and, uh, uh, and that is, uh, you know, I, I can't use the word Ultima, and we're definitely not doing a story which is, uh, you know, a derivative work, but, uh, 
Uh, it, it, I often describe it as the spiritual successor to Ultima. So if, if you are familiar with any of my work, there's no question you will recognize the structure of the game uh, and, and even, uh, even contains a story about virtues and all this sort of thing uh, built into a, a game that actually uh, uh, dials up and down between solo player and massively multiplayer either automatically on its own when it wants to for storytelling or you can actually set it yourself. So if you get tired of having other people <clears throat> crowd out your cities, uh, you just turn it down to solo player and run around without them. Um, please describe what kind of gaming rig a uh, Richard Garriott has at his house, and please feel free to get techie and specky. <laughs> uh, well, you know, what's interesting about that is, at the moment, I happen to have a really high-end machine, but that's mm. actually rare. Okay. Uh, you know, right now I have... Uh, Can you say uh, what it is? Yeah, it's an Origin brand PC. Oh, okay, of course. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that, uh, you know, I've also, you know, down through the years, had Alienware and Razer are two mm -hmm. also my favorites, uh, favorite brands, so... Uh, those are the, when I buy a new machine, those mm -hmm. have sort of been in sequence, the recent ones I've, I've acquired. Uh, but what's interesting is <clears throat> I usually try to see the game in about as bad of conditions as it's viewable mm -hmm. because uh, the real risk is that we, the creators, uh, fool or delude ourselves into mm -hmm. believing that the game is actually operating better than it is because right, right. we've bought ourselves around the problem. Yeah. And so occasionally I will up upgrade just because of my machine's gotten so old it's you know, completely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I did that recently. So the, my machines, uh, both home and office and my laptop, yeah. happen to be brand new, uh, cutting edge machines. Uh, but the hardest part for me about a machine is just memory storage. I have a three terabyte Dropbox uh, okay. of data. Uh, two terabytes of it is space. And so, yeah. uh, uh, and so every, every machine I have has to have a giant uh, hard drive, mm -hmm. you know, in addition to being uh, you know, as cutting edge on the graphics as possible. Um, so as I, th I think I mentioned earlier, we had a lot of excitement that you were coming in. Um, our own Matthew Murray just even had a few questions, which, which I'll, I'll read for him. Okay, this is from Matt Murray. What do you personally consider the most important, innovative, and or transformative titles in computer gaming history uh, that you did not work on yourself? Oh yeah, okay, well, so uh, I'll give you sort of, I'll, I'll try to get exactly the answer out of this description. Um, it's only about once every two years mm -hmm. that I find a game that I embrace so much that I am compelled to play it to completion. Mm -hmm. I try a lot of games, yeah. but I usually play, if it's like a role-playing game, I'll play it for three or four levels, so I go, eh, I kind of get where they're headed, and that's usually enough. Mm -hmm. But I can name for you all the games I've ever finished that I did not write, just because, uh, yeah. because, I, because there's so few. Yeah, yeah. So the first game I ever played to completion that I did not write was Myst. Okay. Which I think is a phenomenal game to this day. Mm -hmm. In fact, I backed their abduction. I have it, and I haven't haven't played it yet. So I got to find time to to play abduction. But huge fan, and uh, and that even that did teach me a lot about uh, how to do storytelling, mm -hmm. com basically completely with visuals. Mm -hmm. um, then I'll get the rest of these kind of out of order. But I was a big fan of the original Command and Conquer. So the uh, and what's interesting is even though I also played the original Warcraft RTS, mm -hmm. and I've played a lot of those the sequels to those. Uh, I actually still think the original Command and Conquer had something really magic about it in the sense of the strategies and tactics could, that could be used and deployed versus just being a race to build. Mm -hmm. uh, the original Medal of Honor uh, was another favorite in the first person shooter yeah. category. The original Battlefield 1942 mm -hmm. kind of taught me about how you could actually balance a game that had diverse modes of play on vehicles and you know, by hand. Uh, I, uh, I, I was a big player of World of Warcraft. I mean, big, big for me. I played it to level 26 or something, which I think is below the starting level these days. But, uh, uh, but at least I, have a, I was a big fan and, and, and played it extensively. More recently, I actually moved over to, the, the, to, to mobile devices. Yeah, yeah. And so what's interesting on mobile devices is, as a, as a player, I was sort of waiting for it to come of age. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when you had physical buttons on your, on your phone... You know, playing Snake was hard enough, much less Frogger. Yeah. And, uh, and the response at the time was so low, it just didn't work. And so even when the first iPhone came out, it took a while before somebody developed a game that I thought was great. And what's interesting is I have a folder of, uh, of the games on, uh, on, uh, uh, on iOS mm -hmm. where I still keep all my tri the games that I consider AAA. It's the first game I ever played that I really enjoyed was one called Spider. And it was just a put your finger on the, on the map of a house and drag, walk, run around the house, Click to squat, click to jump, and make a web to catch bugs. Mm -hmm. That was the end of it, but it proved the user interface model and the visual beauty of, of what a new this new device can do. Mm -hmm. And others that I played, I would actually say on these, my, my true favorites were things like Plants vs. Zombies to this day. That's probably my most recent absolute favorite mm -hmm. game. And I know it's already four or five years old, yeah. 
But that's the that's the one of the most recent ones. I'm going like, okay, that just was just perfect game beginning to end. Uh, and uh, another interesting one was uh, kind of on the other end of the spec uh, other end of the spectrum. Uh, I'm also into indie games, mm -hmm. and so uh, there's this one called A Dark Room, mm -hmm. and you're uh, probably looking at the graphics right there. That is the state-of-the-art graphics of you know four boxes and some text, uh -huh. and uh, <laughs> and and despite the fact that the graphics are four boxes and some text, mm -hmm. really thoroughly enjoyed it. Played it all the way to completion. Wow. Uh, so, so again, that's a pretty short list. I mean, I mm -hmm. might think of a couple more if I had a little more time to think about it. Oh, uh, one more to mention. I'm, I'm, I'm a really a PC and now mobile gamer. Mm -hmm. There was one time I switched over to consoles, and that was for Parappa the Rappa. Okay. If you guys remember that, sort of the first kind of bounce, move, kind of sing-songy, press buttons at the right timing mm -hmm. game. Uh, kind of pre-dance dance revolution kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I actually bought all my relatives uh, PS2s or 3s or whatever that originally came out on mm -hmm. at the time. Uh, but... Uh, but you know, if I if if I had to then I, that was sort of a sideways answer to your question. If I had to pick others that were really kind of genre building, I did mention you know Command and Conquer and uh, 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 you know Medal of Honor and some of these others for those for what, for what turned me on to those genres. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's a genre I missed. You know, Doom and Quake uh, were obviously uh, also very uh, inspirational to me too to mm -hmm. just see what could be done in that genre in the mm -hmm. first-person shooter genre in particular. Cool. Uh, Facebook, you have a question. If someone has never played any of your games, <coughs> which one should they play? And also, is there a way to play your older games? Yeah, you can. All my games are uh, available on good old games, all the way back to a Calabath. Uh, mm. You can find them in there, and I think a Calabath. It's first. actually on a mobile. You were showing me before. Oh yeah, the, fact, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. You can play it even. Uh, the, yeah, I think uh, I think it's for sale on the App Store yeah. in the case of a Calabath. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, the uh, you can actually play a Calabath even uh, even on your phone if you like. Right. But uh, uh, but if you were going to play one, what's interesting is, if I had two favorites, I would I would say they're Ultima Four and Ultima Seven. Mm. And depending on if you're really only going to play one ever, or if you're going to try to play the series, my advice would be a little different. I mean, if you're only going to play one and just to know what it is, I'd start with Ultima Seven. That's kind of sort of the the last of the kind of r the great run up that I think they had uh, with those. But if you're willing to play something a little more archaic. Uh, then I would actually start with Ultima 4 and then play 4 and 5 and 6 mm -hmm. and 7 would be my recommendation. Cool. Okay, so we're just going to move on to a, a lightning round now. We're just yeah. going to give some fa fast answers. I think I know the answer to this, but uh, do you use Windows or Mac? Windows. Windows. Uh, you know, I use iOS on a mobile, mm -hmm. but uh, on PCs, uh, 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 the Windows wins, mm -hmm. despite uh, its huge flaws. Well, next question was going to be Android or iOS. Uh, what was a recent electronics purchase that you've been really impressed by? Recent electronics per purchase. You know, uh, I still buy, uh, I don't buy stereo gear as much anymore, mm -hmm. and I get all my computing hardware and VR hardware for free or for business. So <laughs> it would actually still go into the area of, of televisions. You know, so mm -hmm. it's interesting that uh, I'm constantly impressed with how much bigger, lighter, crisper, uh, powerful frame flicker rate, d d d black depth. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, televisions has become, and so how just, big is the TV in your living room? You know, it's not it's not as big as it could be. It's okay. uh, it's but it's not small. It's sixty or seventy inches, okay. which is you know large. Yeah. But uh, but I wouldn't yet call obscene. Okay. In my book. Um, will the singularity occur in twenty fifty four? Uh, the singularity is coming. Okay. Uh, and it was it was at Ray Kurzweil's date, yep. twenty fifty four. About there, yeah. Uh, and so uh, you know, it's interesting. My wife studies this in some detail, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think he's pretty close. I mean, okay. he, it might be it might be a little after that. I mean, it, and we're getting scarily close to that date. Mm -hmm. But uh, but the fundamental factors that drive for it don't seem to be abating. Abating. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, he, it, it'll be it'll be close to that. Uh, well, you've been to space. Is there intelligent life out there? While you were out there, did you see any? Uh, did not see any. Okay, yeah. uh, is there out there somewhere? Of course, yeah, yeah. I think the answer statistically is I sure hope so. Okay. I, bl I believe the answer is yes, mm -hmm. and I sure hope the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. But I'm also very confident the answer is no, we mm -hmm. have not. Uh, although I do find that funny. You know, I, when, I, when I was flying in space, one of the things I sincerely wanted to do, mm -hmm. but I didn't, and I think I should have, was go on the ham radio in the middle of the night over flying over Australia mm -hmm. or someplace yeah. and go, there it is, out the window. It's, I, I think it's a flying saucer. You know, just some kind of thing to allude to UFOs, mm -hmm. uh, just because I think it would be funny. Yeah. Uh, but my, my, when, I, when I mentioned this joke to my dad, my dad was, oh, don't you dare. He said, that would be catastrophic for humanity mm -hmm. for you to do that. Because even my dad, I, somewhere on my phone I have a, a picture from a newspaper, sort of like the, the, the inquirer of its day. It was called the Tattler. Mm -hmm. and, and the Tattler 
uh, claimed that my father claimed that he saw UFOs in space, uh -huh. and the UFOs followed all the space, you know, followed the Apollo astronauts to the moon and back, and mm -hmm. includes all the stuff with my dad's picture on this. And you know, this is like my dad hates it because <laughs> he absolutely does not believe in UFOs. He absolutely mm -hmm. does not believe he ever saw any, uh, and uh, uh, and yet these things exist. So, uh, Facebook, you have a question. So you raised the funding for Shadow of the Avatar through Kickstarter. How do you feel about Kickstarter as a platform for developers? Well, so what's interesting about Kickstarter as a platform is the, that there seem to be sort of two categories of things that work. And this is at least in games, but it may be true across the board, uh, that it either needs to be a product that is so fancy and newfangled and unexpected uh, that no one's really thought about it much before and it somehow resonates with, yeah, I need that. Uh, and that's pretty hard to do. You know, if you, if you were told to go invent a, a product that had that, those attributes, uh, at least I know I would be stumped, and I think most of us would be stumped. And so, uh, but it's a way that if you happen, in, happen upon one of those and, and the big companies don't like it because they think it's uh, too new to, to place a bet on, then you can go to the court of public opinion and, and get your funding. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing that seems to go well, which is what the category we fit into, is broadly described, or I would broadly describe as nostalgia. People that go, hey, you know, I, this guy's got a track record, or this product has a history, and you know, that's something I liked it before. I know I'd like to continue seeing these. And for whatever reasons, the big companies aren't providing that for me, so sure, I'll, I'll be happy to help manifest that uh, into reality. And so, so as a fundamental concept, I love it a lot. Uh, it's allowing us to do this game. Uh, but it does come at some very interesting costs. Uh, for example, you, know, you, never really, you never really know how much funding you're going to get. And you don't really have the you know, infinite money behind that to back you up if things go wrong. And so you're always living you're with a very interesting sort of Damocles hanging over you to, you know, are we going to make it another month and another month and another month? Uh, and, uh, and you add to that, uh, another interesting side effect is that because we're using the, the audiences, the, our, our backers, our, our community's money, you sort of feel obligated to make sure they know how you're spending every penny. Because the, the, at least for us, the emotionally worst thing you can imagine is if you fail to make the game they want, and then they wonder how you spent their money. They debate, like, did you, use your, did you buy yourself a bunch of first class tickets? Or did you, you know, all have, go out for fancy meals? Or somehow other squander our money? Or pocket it yourself? Or whatever it might be. And so we give our community full access to what's happening inside. We, we do our daily reports to the community. We show them everything we're doing. And, um, uh, and, uh, and we think that we owe that to them. Mm -hmm. The downside is most of these people have never been in product development before. So when they look at a game going like, we, we shipped our version one 38 months ago. So we're in version 38. 38 months ago, the first version we shipped to them was an avatar in a room with a chair and a torch you could turn on and off, a chair you could sit in, and a chicken that if you walked through it, it went bok, bok, and ran away. That was the whole game. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so some people are like, what's this? Others are going like, all right, at least it started. And the people that are with us from the beginning go like, oh, next month it has a map, and the next month it has monsters, and the next month mm -hmm. I have two characters, and the next month I have some clothes I can wear, and the next month I can talk to people. But the people who come in for their first month, like now, in, 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 in uh, episode or you know, release 38, they're like going like, this game's not done. And we're going like, dude, you do not know how far we've come. <laughs> <laughs> we've had 38 months of substantial increase every time. And yes, we know it's not finished. We told you that in advance. But... Uh, uh, but some people are in for that and some people are not, but we usually have to educate people mm -hmm. through that process. Um, just have two more uh, lightning round questions to go. Sure. Uh, is Bigfoot out there? Uh, no. No. Okay. no. You know, I've never gotten one single yes on that question. You know, yeah. and what's interesting about that is we yeah. actually do find new species all the time, and yeah. occasionally even a, a new relatively large species. Yeah. Like I think the last one at least I'm familiar with is in somewhere in Asia they found a new variant of a deer, basically. Uh, but, you know, uh, there was a small population of something that didn't look that profoundly different than other things that were around. And, yeah. you know, if its bones had been encountered previously, they would have just been, you know, thought of as bones of something else probably. Mm -hmm. uh, but, no, I, I don't think there's any uh, worthy evidence for Bigfoot or, sadly, Nessie mm -hmm. or a few of these other, or the Chupacabra <laughs> or a few others. Yeah. Uh, what is the, and the last one is, what is a recent task, little or big, that you've been able to master? Hmm, a little task that I've been able to master. Uh oh. Little or big. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. so I've been I've been helping my daughter learn piano. Okay. And so uh, yeah, my mother used to, you know, I have done the chopsticks yeah, and yeah. Uh, -dum 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 kind of songs. Uh, but this is the first time where she can actually now read the sheet music and I can't. But because <laughs> I'm an adult, 
I can watch the fingering, mm -hmm. and I'm sort of I'm sort of passively learning how to play the piano through osmosis. Through osmosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't learn French, which she and uh, my daughter and my wife speak fluently mm -hmm. with each other. And when they talk about secrets, you, when they talk yeah, about yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. But uh, but I'm picking up a little piano. Yeah. Um, okay, well, that, that's it. Uh, do you have anything else you want to plug? You have Shroud of Avatar. You have a new book, which is out now, available at all the places you can buy books. Uh, anything else you want to plug or things those people are, should those check Those are the two big things happening in my life right now. Yeah. Is uh, uh, you know, Please go check out Amazon.com for mm -hmm. the book. Uh, mm -hmm. Come play Shroud of the Avatar. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you want to go do zero G flights, I can help you with that too. Right. But uh, what's, your, what's your company called? The zero that's G? called Zero G Corp. Okay, uh, Zero G. So uh, we where, fly where all over the country. We, over? Uh, most major cities, we fly out of sometime during the year. You can go online and look at the schedule and okay. sign up. Um, actually, I just see Facebook. You have one last question. Let's do it. Are you planning any book signings? I am. In fact, tonight I'm doing one at the Explorers Club here in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm on the board of the Explorers Club up at 70th and Park, approximately between mm -hmm. Park and, and Lex, uh, and. Uh, uh, and I just did one in Austin, Texas, and I have one coming up in California, and we're adding mm -hmm. dates now. So mm -hmm. I actually have a website, richardgarriott.com. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll try to make sure we put it up there. I'm not yeah. sure there is a list there now, but I'll, I'll make sure we get it there. Um, and also, I'm going to give you a free plug, is that you will be appearing at the New York Game Awards on Thursday night, uh, which we'll be covering here at PC Mag and our sister publication, geek.com, and our own Jordan Miner will be a, a presenter there, so check that out. Um, and then also a note for the show, next Thursday, January 26th, we will have uh, MIT researcher Kate Darling, who works on robots. She's going to bring bro robots actually here into the studio. Uh, that will be next Thursday at 2 o'clock p.m., so check that out. Um, and then for anybody who's here for the first time, give us a like, give us a share. We always appreciate those. Um, check out some of our past interviews. We've done a lot of cool ones. Uh, and so thanks to everyone. Thanks to the Peanut Gallery. <laughs> thanks to Social Pete's. Thanks to um, Sir Britain. British, excuse me. And um, as always, be good to each other. Peace. <laughs>